Hello, everybody. Welcome on the Lights on Data show. Today, we have an amazing topic. We're going to talk about AI in healthcare. And to do this, we have an amazing guest with us, Eugenio Zuccarelli. He is a data science leader at CVS Health, which if you haven't heard of CVS Health, it's a Fortune 500 company and the number one healthcare company in the world. Eugenio is a Forbes 30 under 30, as well as a TEDx speaker. He studied at MIT, he studied at Harvard, and at Imperial College. His analysis helped develop policy recommendations for the White House, for mm. CEOs and leading research institutions to take action in key situations, such as the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Eugenio is a recipient of over 15 honors and awards, including the John McCarthy Award for Contributions to AI, Nova Talent of the Year, and the ISPI BCG Future Leaders Award. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yes, welcome, Eugenio. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, thank you very much for being here. What an impressive resume. We can't wait to hear all your insights about AI and healthcare. But before we start, as always, we wanted to ask you about a hobby of yours. Yeah. I actually love art, fun enough, <gasps> because I probably have too much maths and quantitative stuff in my day to day life. So I'm a big art fan. Every time I can, I try to not look at the data, not look at the number, and I try to focus on like, the beauty and the art and try to connect with everything else that is not too rational, so to say. So that's really what I like. That's nice. Lovely. And you also live in a place that has a lot to offer with respect to that, I find. New York, you mean? Yes. <laughs> All right. So let's get to the topic. So can you please tell us what artificial intelligence is and how it is being used in healthcare? Yeah, that's already a pretty difficult question because <laughs> I would define AI as the ability of a system to learn from data, learn patterns uh, in ways that are similar to the ways that humans do. But I would say it's a relatively vague and reductive definition. It's very complex one, a bit like with big data, it's a difficult mm -hmm. definition to give. And it's definitely having a lot of impacts, that's for sure what we can see, especially in healthcare. It's saving lives, it's making predictions. And some of the stuff I like the most about AI in healthcare is how it's completely reshaping people's health, people's quality of life, and especially it's shifting what we consider medicine from curing a disease into preventing it. And then personalizing all of these interventions to, to target the use of a person. So I think that's fascinating. And healthcare is such a wide industry as well. Like you mentioned, anywhere from producing that medicine to delivering it, to delivering care overall. And healthcare also is at home with each one of us to, to continue improving our, our lives too. I guess my question then on that is, as we're adapting and adopting all these new technologies and we're having all these different pieces that gather data about ourselves. Is there a way to have it centrally to combine somehow in, in a curated way that is then informing our healthcare professionals to be able to deliver personalized treatment to us? Yeah, definitely. That's the goal with AI, especially in healthcare is uh, trying to tackle the data issue. I often tell everybody that asks me, but it's not really about skills. It's not really about algorithms. So algorithms are fantastic. It's a matter of data, especially in the yeah. healthcare sector, because of all of the complexities, you yeah. struggle to find the fuel for these algorithms. And so the idea is definitely for everyone working in health tech the intersection to solve the issue of interoperability. So having hospitals and systems talking to each other mm -hmm. in a private and secure way, so you can both have privacy, security on your data, but at the same time, also the value that you get in having access to the data. That's a bit the, in my opinion, the catalyst. As soon as we're going to be able to fix that issue, we're going to be able to really experience all of these technologies like ChatGPT and all of the other cool algorithms also in the healthcare industry. By the way, I heard that ChatGPT passed OCD, some medical tests. Excuse my lack of knowledge in the field, but it's the, I think it's the journal practitioner maybe test that yeah, future doctors so. give. Yeah. Yeah. That's 
one of the tricky situations too, because when these algorithms are able to do these things, able to pass these exams, does that mean that we can trust them or not? That's one of the big questions. And of course you can say it was able to pass those tests. Technically you should. Mm -hmm. Then we know, especially of those that work in the technical aspects and especially in the medicine technical aspects, that's not this easy. And so right. medicine is so much more than just a test. It's all of the experience you gain, all of the understanding and even more importantly, you know, the human component. So to me, I see ChatGPT one day you know, or algorithms like this helping doctors for sure, but I don't really see them replacing the figure mm -hmm. of the doctor, I think, especially the human component, it's yeah. impossible to replicate. And one of the reasons I go to the doctor is just because I want to ask them questions. I want to feel that human touch. And sometimes like my psychologist or they just reassure me, everything is fine. And uh, my personal questions more than the technical ones. But that's good news twice, right? We have yet another tool to support our doctors, but at the same time, we still want to keep the doctors. So it, in my opinion, it's, a, it improves the healthcare and at least if it stays <laughs> the way that it is, right? So more concretely, what would be some examples of AI in healthcare, some successful applications? Yeah, there are a lot. Honestly, one of the ones I like the most is AI as a tool for clinicians, exactly as you said, as, a, as an additional stethoscope, as an MRI machine. So an additional tool that they can use to get more insights. Mm -hmm. And for instance, you know, when I was at MIT, I did a lot of research with clinicians on how can we create an app for smartphone, for tablets that clinicians can use where they can get predictions on the likelihood mm -hmm. of surviving a specific surgery. So as a doctor, the question says, I have this patient, especially if they're children, it's a very tricky situation. You might know that perhaps for an adult, you want to do this type of procedure. But for a child, especially mm -hmm. when they have comorbidities, so other diseases, other diagnoses, it's a bit mm -hmm. complex. And so it's not so clear cut. That's Ooh. such a, yeah, su such an interesting application. It makes me think of this Star Wars quote because I am a fan. And when Han Solo goes, never tell me the odds. And I wonder, once a doctor sees those stats, it, it doesn't that, I can see how it can help to maybe choose and uh, between maybe different options of procedures or understand that the urgency of the whole situation. But wouldn't that also create some nerves and say, okay, this patient only has a 20% chance of survival. This is the only way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That's exactly <laughs> the most complex part is that you can develop a tool. You can develop an AI system. You can use data, but then how is that end user in this case, the clinician going to use it? How are they going to perceive it? Are they going to embrace it? Or are they going to be feeling a bit reluctant in the use? And so that's one of the trickiest components and there is not really a clear cut answer to say, how can you make sure that a tool is used? It doesn't get the nerves of the doctors or it doesn't create more stress in that situation. Mm -hmm. I would say that though to mitigate that risk, it's mm -hmm. key, not just to code these algorithms and work on them, but to have an ongoing conversation with the doctors. For instance, you know, we, since the beginning, we knew how important it was to have doctors understanding the system, understanding the algorithm and being on board with them throughout the whole process. And so we started from a simple linear regression, logistic regression models to the user interface, always working with the doctors, not us telling them what the system should have been, but rather doing what they wanted to have and to see. It was a fantastic relationship and helped us then create a product that actually was used and was pretty helpful for them. But that's key. You know, it's more of an algorithm. It's just the relationship that you have and how can you make sure that you resolve an actual problem and don't create more. Brilliant. Dan Everett, who's joining us here online. Hi, Dan. He's mentioning anchoring bias. And this makes me think of the whole ethical implications and how do we ensure then that the use of AI in healthcare, of course, is ethical and responsible. Exactly. Like and that's to some extent, you know, one of the key components there is how can you make sure that something is ethical and how can you make sure something is used? They tend to go hand in hand. You 
usually try to make these systems explainable, interpretable, so that they can both be okay on an ethical level, but they can also be used by these doctors, clinicians, or anyone else. And I'll say that's one of the, one of the key components sometimes of a success or not of a system is, you know, if you develop a deep learning algorithm, if you've got something like ChatGPT, of course, you're going to have a lot of pushback from experts because they do want to use these tools, but they cannot trust them. We know that sometimes these algorithms make up information, act confident, but they don't really know the answer. And so instead maybe focusing on simpler models or interpretable models so that the doctors can look into and understand what's the decision-making process that helps much more, both in terms of ethics, but also in terms of uh, gaining the trust of the doctors. Right. And of course, all the data behind it, that all these models are being based on to make sure that it is representing a wide enough range of the population and uh, it's able to provide as much thorough data that the model can be based on as possible. Right. Yeah. The wider the better. Scott Taylor is in the house and he'll say it's all about the truth, <laughs> but the truth of course needs to rely on very good data quality pieces too. <laughs> Hi Scott. <laughs> Hi Scott. So then from your experience so far, Eugenio, how can healthcare providers and organizations best prepare for the integration of AI into their practice? It's a great question. And I would say it's probably along two lines, one being data. So getting into this pattern of understanding the value of data. I would say there is usually this clear understanding that if I share data, if I encode data and so on, the possibilities of breaches, issues, data being compromised, and it's very clear. It's very clear the drawback of sharing information and making that available. But at the same time, what's sometimes less clear is the fact that you don't gain the possible value in having maybe the models used and trained on this data. And so definitely understanding the importance of investing in a data infrastructure system, the importance of investing also in the coding all of this information, because the more of this data is coded and is stored, the better models we can make and the more value we can provide to the end users, which are the patients. And so to some extent, the interests align there. The doctor wants to make the best for the patient. And at the same time, if they invest in data, it's not taking away time from a patient. It's actually providing also a valuable outcome there. But at the same time, it's a bit of a cultural shift in the sense that mm. a lot of the blockers are more cultural rather than more technological. And so that's probably the first shift, changing the culture and changing the way we see all of these tools are not really here to replace anyone, but right. to empower them. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking while you were saying. I was, my, I wanted to ask about resistance and if you've encountered any resistance with the people that you've worked with and how did you manage that? Yeah, there's usually a lot of resistance, I would say, it's not just in the healthcare industry, but in every industry, yes. you know, everybody's afraid, everybody's concerned. And you know, me as a scientist, of course, I can see how someone can be concerned because you have these tools that they can have better algorithms and better code than data scientists. So why should I not be concerned? I would say that it, it goes both ways. So to some extent is understanding that it's about being flexible. It's about new tools and how we can leverage them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, is how can we communicate this better? And mm -hmm. I feel that sometimes where maybe data scientists can do a better job. So a lot of times when we talk to doctors, when we talk to financial professionals or any type of professional, we tend to focus a bit too much on the technicalities, on the models, on the systems. And we lack a bit that human component of understanding what do they care about and how this can help them rather than replace them. I would say, so it's a lot about when people say communicating with data and uh, communication. I think it boils down to that is understanding that you want to make sure that you align this product, this new tool, with their benefit and also can empower some rather than start to do something. Oh, absolutely. Diana has actually worked in, is it like the second largest hospital in Canada? And uh, she can definitely tell you that implementing change, introducing a new set of technology 
it's difficult from that change manas- management perspective and uh, with some and of the healthcare practitioners. Especially, yes, I find, I hope I, it doesn't bother anyone that I say that, but especially with physicians who I believe they don't, especially them, they don't like other people telling them how to do things or how to change their workflows. So I definitely find that, especially in this industry, that the resistance is a little bit high, could potentially be higher. And it, it requires a little bit more communication, a little bit more empowerment and more of co-design of these solutions with physicians. So they have exactly, as you said, they have a say in how those tools work, how they function and how they actually support what they do in their everyday work. And that's exactly it. To some extent, you know, it makes sense. Like you do want clinicians that push back on all of these technologies because it's a very high stake environment. You know, it's the life of patients or their health at least at stake. And especially on the AI side, on the data science side, it's really difficult to quantify the value of a model or of investing in the data infrastructure. And I would say that any data scientist would love to be able to say very quickly, oh, if you do this model, you're going to get these people, these many people saved or this much money saved, but it's really difficult to quantify it. And so it's a matter of trust. And of course, a clinician or any other professional has to take a bit of a leap of faith in investing in these yeah. technologies. Yeah. There are some side conversations happening here in, in our audience, and I'm seeing one between Dan Everett, the techno optimist and Susan Walsh, the classification guru. Welcome, Susan. And they're really talking about that importance of data and the data quality and the fact that data problems are people problems. And in the medical space, it's really so hard when we're feeling things, for example, as patients, you might have the same cause, but we might be feeling it differently in the way we're describing it is differently. When does the same thing get recorded in different ways? There are just really so many questions as Susan Walsh is putting it. And uh, it's definitely hard. And hopefully something like AI will be able to discern through some of the noise and help um, health practitioners deliver that to healthcare a little bit quicker and better. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's one of the key components, you know, like how can you make sure that the data quality is high and it often boils down to how can you incentivize data quality and how can you incentivize a doctor to not just focus on the patient, but also taking care in coding the data, coding the information. It's a matter of, to some extent, about incentivizing this, uh, these good behaviors. Eugenia, with the uh, with the recent pandemic, have you used or have you seen that usage of AI in healthcare at, at all in regards to the pandemic? Yeah, definitely. Like in a lot of cases, and actually, probably the pandemic was one of those good examples of how sometimes not to use AI and uh-huh. data. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, especially in the AI and data science community, you've seen a lot of people that very positively, you know, it's great, wanted to make a contribution to the world and actually use the skills to something that was really important and really critical. But it's sometimes challenging to see how some of these algorithms, tools, sure, they can be used, but they have a lot of complexities around. And so it's very easy to put together a model on data that you find online on COVID-19 and related hospitalizations and deaths and so on, and add an additional model to all of the ones available online. But sometimes the ethical implications, the bias implications, the quality of data implications really cause some problems, but probably even worse than the benefits that the model can have. Very interesting. Something so is like a lot of information, sometimes way too much information, discording thoughts and the models are pointed to different directions. And so I wouldn't say that helped too much. But I would imagine what it is secluded from the norm, I would assume because of the whole urgency of the situation, a lot of things were passed at a quicker pace and not going through all the checks and balances as they regularly would. But that's my assumption. Yeah. That's one of those ways for sure. All right. What about the other side? What about the patient side? What role do patients play in the development and implementation of AI in healthcare? Yeah, that's a key one too. And it's both sides, the doctor's side, that's a key role in itself, but the patient side too. I would say one of course of the 
components and understanding how these tools are for the benefit of all of us. And so definitely trusting fair use, being of course skeptical about them, but definitely understanding that it's just an additional data point. It's not a decision maker. It's just a tool that provides some insights on their well-being. And I would say also to try and be advocates of all of this shift towards more data and more AI in the healthcare sector and in any other sector, because the more we have this demand from patients, the more we can shift governments or hospitals into taking those decisions. And probably also it boils down to kind of like culture and how can we make people understand concepts like maybe sometimes false positives and false negatives and some of the drawbacks of these models that they cannot be perfect, they can help in many cases. Sometimes they might not be too correct, but it doesn't mean that we should not go in that direction. So definitely try and be advocates of this whole shift. Oh, thank you. Eugenia, do you have a sense of what's the pulse of the population's um, desire to embrace AI in healthcare? It's a tough one. I would say it also depends a lot across countries. I was seeing some statistics across the world, not specific to the healthcare industry, but just in general. And it seems that emerging countries, BRICS countries, they tend to be more optimistic about the benefits of AI compared to more developed countries. So you see, let's say the US, Europe, and so on being a bit more skeptical about embracing AI compared to India, Brazil, Russia, China, and so on. And not very sure why, they don't really look too much into it, but you can clearly see how across the world there's a lot of different opinions. And so that's for sure one also of the drivers for countries or for organizations. If the people are some of the advocates, then you can definitely have more progress. I just want to take a question here from Dan. He's asking, do you see AI helping with standardizing procedure coding and billing coding when medical practitioners don't enter it properly? Yeah, actually that's the use case that I'm the most optimistic about for something like ChatGPT for a lot of different reasons. If you see doctors, they spend way too much time on all of the admin stuff. They don't spend much time on the, or at least not as much time as they would like with the patients because they have to spend hours, at least in the US, in enter all of the information, all of the ICD-10 codes, all of the CPT codes for these patients. And so I see a future, maybe not too far away, where they can just type a summary or even maybe just say it out loud as they do the, as they go in the visit. And then ChatGPT or whatever our algorithm deals with entering the right ICD-10 codes, depending on the words that the doctor uses, and then creates all the information in a structured format for the database, so relieving all of the burden from the doctor. I think that's going to be a fantastic use case. So how can you know, artificial intelligence be used to improve the patient outcomes and at the same time to reduce the cost? In a lot of different ways, but I'd say it boils down to try and make people healthier, because if you make people healthier, you of course have a positive impact on them on a quality of life level, but at the same time also on a, an economic level. You know, if you've got a person that doesn't go to the hospital, it's for sure fantastic because you know, you're know you better, you're feeling better, you get healthier, but you also don't have to incur in all of the expenses related to going to hospital or having to take medications. And so I'd say that's one of the areas around the, that I find most fascinating in AI for healthcare and the use of data in healthcare is how can we align these two components that usually go not too well together? So the financial incentive for people, patients, for organizations, and also their quality of life. I would say that it's a great use case because you see that you can have both health for patients and financial returns for themselves, but also for organizations. And uh, how do you then see that relationship between AI and healthcare just evolving in the future? I would hope to see more of a collaboration type of relationship. So where AI is going to start to become much more of a tool for doctors. They will understand that they can pull the plug on AI whenever they want. They can turn it off whenever they want. And so in a sort of 
approach where doctors will still be in charge, will still be the decision makers, but will have more data points. And hopefully they're not just going to be data points about as of now, like estimating something as of now, but rather it's going to be about predicting the future. And in this way, they can enhance their ability to prevent something for a patient. So definitely collaboration and trying to also look ahead in the future. Yeah, like that, that sounds really good. I'm, I'm curious, Eugenio, how, to what degree do you actually need medical background in what you do? It's a great question because I would say not too much, but at the same time, the medical components, of course, the single most important in everything I do in the sense that always the same with data and AI, you can definitely put together an algorithm and you can take data that is numeric and without understanding it, you can put together a model, but then it's all about whether that model is effective and it's actually going to be used and that all boils down to the medical background. And so, of course, it's great to have a medical background. I do not have one. And so I think it's extremely important in this setting, but in any other setting to connect with domain experts yeah. as much as possible. And so you might have a domain background or you might not, but in any case, it's super important to connect with, let's say, clinicians to understand, does this matter? Like, do you actually care about this? Is this important for a patient or is it something that I think it's interesting and I think I can do, it might be cool, a technological improvement. So connecting with the experts is probably the most important component. Nice. Thank you for this. If anyone would like to follow your path or to get a chance to work in AI, especially in healthcare, what would you suggest to them? Definitely to try and get their hands dirty as much as possible in the sense that there are so many online courses, so many different platforms. And so to try and do projects as much as they can using data and there are great tools like Kaggle or Google data sets. So thousands of opportunities online in terms of courses and in terms of resources. So try and understand as much as they can from these online tools without having to pay for a degree, which is not a given. And to try also though to understand with people, with experts, as we said, what are the things that matter and how some of their solutions could be used or could not be used in a real life setting. Because I think that when you stop at just you know, creating a project, an AI project online, it's not very clear if it's going to be right or wrong on the human level, on the product level. And so that's probably one of the most important components when you go in a real life scenario is uh, not just I know how to code this, but I know that it's going to solve the problem and it's going to be helpful. Thank you, Eugenio. And yes, okay. sure, hands dirty, but keep your data clean. <laughs> and on that note... Me? I have one more thing to ask, I promise. It's the last. So you said, Eugenio, that you're excited about ChatGPT and how this use case can, can bring more people on board. You talked about preventive medicine. And is there any other thing that excites you about AI and the future of AI in, in healthcare? Yeah, definitely. I think that in general, the possibility of having better quality of life, I would love to see all of these different ways where AI can improve us and make us become better human beings. Also things even like mental health. I have no idea right now, but I'm sure there are going to be like so many different ways mm -hmm. AI and data can help us become better people and better human beings in ways that we cannot even think about right now. And so that potential, that unknown potential is something that I find fascinating, how it can change us as a society. Amazing. I love it. Sounds really good. Thank you very much, Eugenia. It was lovely. We learned so much from you. It's very exciting what you do every day. Please continue to do it. I believe you have a great impact in the, in the world. Thank you very much, everyone, as well, for the questions, for being here, for spending your time with us, and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.